Welcome to a series of four videos from Chapter 7, Section 1, Subsection 13, dealing with trust geometry. And some of these are going to be a little long because there are a lot of really important issues having to do with design and how you express structure, which I think is fairly important to architectural designers. We're going to start off by focusing on parallel chord truss geometry. And our first video will deal with square and rectangular bay trusses. Um, <clears throat> we're going to deal with materials. We'll occasionally touch on wood, but by and large we're going to deal with steel because steel works really well both in tension and compression and lends itself very well to high quality connections which can develop the full strength of the members. We'll look at uh, the member cross section and try to understand what kinds of cross sections we might choose for different circumstances. We'll also look at web patterns and the connection methods. For the moment, we're going to backtrack and remind ourselves of a few basic things having to do with trusses. Here we have a nine square bay truss with a uniform load W across the top. Um, we're going to use the symbol L to designate the length of the truss. So W times L is the to total downward force on the truss. These two reactions at each end by the symmetry of the problem must be equal to each other and the two together must sum to the total downward force. So if the total downward force is WL, then each of these reactions has to be WL over 2. Here we're designating the depth of the truss with the symbol D. Uh, because there are nine square bays, L is equal to 9D for this particular truss. We're not too concerned about that, though, because the the kind of issue that we want to explore has to do more with a generalized expression that relates L to D. So for the purposes of drawing this, we picked a nice simple nine bay truss, but we're going to um, discuss the relationship between L and D in a more variable kind of way. So we can come and slice through this truss at the center and create a free body, which looks like this. So this free body has four of these fully triangulated bays, and we're slicing through this middle bay. And uh, relative to this free body now, we have some forces that are exerted on it by the portion of the truss that we've removed. So we cannot remove half of this truss without replacing that with its effect and the effect is a horizontal compressive force on the top and an equal horizontal tensile force on the bottom. And these two represent a force couple, which we refer to as the internal resisting moment. And its magnitude is the magnitude of one of these forces, H, times the lever arm, which in this case is the depth of the truss. So in the next uh, image, we're going to just draw this free body and then we're going to write out the equations. So here we have that free body again where D is the lever arm and we've picked half of the original truss with a reactive force of WL over 2. And by the way, because we sliced this truss right through the center, uh, the overall length is L over 2 and we still have this uniform load W which we can represent as an equivalent point load at the center of that distribution. So because this is four and a half bays, uh, we're at the center of that four and a half bays. So uh, basically this um, total length is L over two and the total downward force is W times L over two. So that's what we, we've represented right here. And by the way, when we put this force on it, the next step should be that we go and remove this because this point force is from a point of view of the equilibrium of this overall truss 
the equivalent of this force W, which is a distributed force. All right, so we have two vertical forces, a reaction, which is WL over two, and offset from that by one fourth of the length of the truss is another force, a downward force, also of magnitude WL over two. So to refresh your memory, the length of this free body is L over two. This is a uniformly distributed load W. The center of action would be at the center of this free body. And since the free body is of length L over two, this dimension here is half of that or L over four. And that's the lever arm for this vertical force and that vertical force, which together are a pure force couple which is the force couple that's imposed by the fact that we're spanning a distance L under a uniform load W. And the mathematics of all of that, by the way, doesn't have any to do with whether this is a truss or a beam or an arch or a suspension element. Uh, as long as we're supporting that uniform load W over the full length of the, of the spanning structure, uh, we will still have this reactive vertical force, this downward force offset by this lever arm L over four. And so when we calculate the moment of the vertical forces, we would say, well, because it's a force couple and it's pure, it's the magnitude of one of the forces times the perpendicular distance between the lines of action of the two forces. So in other words, it's WL over two times this lever arm, which is L over four. And when we run those numbers out, we get WL squared over eight, which is the uh, imposed moment on the structure that is imposed by the fact that we are spanning a length L under a uniform load W. And again, as long as we're talking about any kind of simple span structure of length L under a uniform load W, this will be the burden that we have to deal with. It's the moment which is imposed on this structure, which is WL squared over eight. The resisting moment is created by H and D, or these two H forces, which are offset by distance D. So the moment of the horizontal forces is H times D. Or we can say for this object to be in equilibrium, HD has to be equal in magnitude to WL squared over eight. In other words, the moment of these horizontal forces has to be equal and opposite or equal in magnitude to the moment of the vertical forces. So we end up with this formula. This is imposed upon us by the fact that we have a load W and we're spanning a distance L. And these are the two variables we can play with. We can adjust the depth. So if we go to a deeper truss, H can be smaller. If we go to a shallower truss where D is smaller, then H has to be larger. So just for diagrammatic purposes in the center here, we have a 24 square bay truss, um, which means it's 24 times as long as it is deep, which is near the shallow end of anything that we tend to use for horizontal trusses. Uh, for parallel cord trusses. Um, and this dimension, these flags, are an indicator of the magnitude of the force here in the top cord member and here in the bottom course cord, cord member. Um, if we made this truss half as deep by just scaling it in the vertical direction, we'd end up with this. So these flags are twice as deep as the corresponding flags before. On the other hand, if we make this truss twice as deep, such as we have here, then the forces are half as much. So clearly the forces become extreme. In fact, look, here we have these very modest vertical forces in the column, which represent the total vertical force that we're resisting. And here we have these unbelievably amplified horizontal forces because we've chosen a geometry that's just not very favorable. Aside from these huge forces, which we don't want to be resisting. Deflection is an enormously important issue. When we go to shallow trusses, the more shallow they are, the more they tend to be controlled by deflection.
And basically, L over 24 is about as shallow a uh, truss as you ever want to deal with. Okay, so that's background. Now we're going to talk about geometry. Um, here are a couple of square bay geometries. In this case, the diagonals are sloped this way on that side and that way on that side. And down here, they're reversed. They're sloped this way on this end and that way on that end. You'll notice, by the way, uh, I've shown in this image, this line is heavier and that line is heavier. What I'm trying to indicate here is where do we have compression where we might need a fatter member to resist buckling. If we were working in steel, we want to keep our compression members as short as possible because steel is inherently very efficient, which means we can end up with very small cross sections, which means that steel is more likely to be vulnerable to buckling. Uh, we can, of course, always solve that by using tubular sections or something that basically billows up the cross section. But as a general rule, in steel, we'll make these verticals um, in compression. And the way we do that is by running the diagonals in this direction. So here are the long members, which are in tension and not vulnerable to buckling, are run in, along this diagonal so that they work in tension. And then the short members are in compression. Up above, the longer members are in compression. Now, we might use this configuration up above in the case of wood, because wood tends to work better in compression. As we said, in compression, the knots actually work for you, whereas in tension, they don't. But also wood, by its inherent nature, tends to produce fatter cross sections because the uh, yield stress of the material is much, much lower than the case for steel. So wood in inherently tends to become fatter and less vulnerable to buckling. So as an example of this geometry at the top, here we have this really bizarre looking structure. And back here we have a column support. And then you'll notice this compression member comes along the diagonal. Then the tension member has been rendered as a steel rod. And then another compression member here. So in this case, they've mixed wood and steel and the steel tension members are rendered just as rods because they're not vulnerable to buckling as long as there's enough load on the roof. But the diagonals are rendered in wood and you'll notice that these wood uh, struts, even though they're along the diagonal and therefore fairly long, they still look reasonably fat. So this is a classic example where you would use this geometry for when you have wood incorporated in the structure, but you wouldn't normally do it for steel. But we could. We could replace every one of these wood struts with a large diameter uh, steel tube or steel pipe and, uh, and use a rectangular steel pipe on the uh, bottom cord and the top cord. And we could make this entire uh, truss out of steel. Um, but that wouldn't be a customary geometry that we would pick. Okay, so in the case of steel, we see the alternative geometry. The diagonals are set in this direction so that they are working in, in tension. And then the verticals are working in compression. And in this case, the verticals have been rendered as larger in diameter or larger in dimension because being in compression they have some vulnerability to buckling. Uh, here's another example. You'll notice these are all vertical. They're parallel to that edge, basically, which is how we know those are vertical. And then these diagonals are running in this direction. In the case of this truss, everything has been made out of round tube because that's the best way to get some decent breadth for resisting compression while at the same time not being overly obstructive to the passage of light. Um, round tubes allow light to pass by them in a lot of different directions without obs obstructing the light too much, whereas wide flange or square sections would tend to uh, obstruct the light more. So here we have a, a 
the exception to the rule. Here they've run the uh, web members exactly the way we uh, have suggested that they would want to. But then out here on this cantilever, which is cantilevering outward and then supporting some more bridge there, you'll notice they just left them running on the diagonal in the wrong direction. So they didn't run them in tension, but they put them in compression. And the bottom line here is this is an illustration of the fact that that's not a problem in steel as long as this compression member is chosen to have some significant breadth. So in this case, they've made this out of large dimension square tube, and that element right there is not going to buckle because it is inherently fat. So this illustrates, by the way, that there are no absolute rules in, in terms of the geometry you choose. If you're d dealing with members that are inherently slender, you would not want to use this kind of geometry where the diagonal's in compression. But in the case of steel, you can have all kinds of cross sections, including really big fat cross sections, and basically solve your buckling problem in that way. Sometimes we make members very thin and very um, limited in their ability to resist compression. So you'll notice here, we have a double angle top cord, double angle bottom cord, then the verticals are also double angles, and then the diagonals are sandwiched between the two top cords, and they're basically quarter inch by two inch steel plates. So they're very slender. If they ever went into compression, um, it would be a serious problem because they would easily buckle. In the case of this roof, there's ballast on the top of the roof that keeps it from being sucked upward. So these members never go into compression. They always work in tension, which is what allows these people to use this very simple geometry. This is really quite elegant because this thin plate sandwiches very cleanly and nicely between the uh, cord members and gives us a nice long edge along which we can weld. And it produces a nice clean geometry but we couldn't use this kind of geometry if it was not for the weight on the roof because otherwise under wind suction, we get a major upward force. These members would go into compression and they would buckle. Here's another example where that's been uh, facilitated. Basically, this is a, a building with very deep trusses to support brick spandrels. These trusses are a moment connected to the columns. Um, for lateral stability purposes. So there are no shear walls and there are no cross bracing. There's just the moment connections between the trusses and the columns. But relative to the trusses, what's interesting to us here is these members are also rendered as flat slabs, which under wind suction could buckle. But in the case of this building, there won't be any such wind uh, suction to overcome the gravity loads because this is supporting a floor, which has a substantial slab weight, but also the spandrel here will be all brick, which is producing a very large amount of load. So we know these elements are always going to be in tension and they're rendered that way. These elements are going to go into compression and they are rectangular tubes. And by the way, the reason they're not square tubes, but they're rectangular, is because they weld to this bottom tube. You'll notice there's a tube at the top and there are tubes at the bottom. And welded to the side of these tubes are angles. These are shelf angles to support the brick. The brick is going to produce an eccentric load, which is tending to produce twist in this bottom cord, which is why the bottom cord has been rendered as a tube uh, to resist that. And then these vertical rectangular tubes are welded to these horizontal tubes to further help restrain those tubes against rotation. And the width of this element is chosen because of its role in helping to stabilize this bottom cord tube against rotating over. This is just a detail at the ends. And again, I note in both directions, there are these tubes.
which support these angles that support the brick. Now, in, in this case, we said some of these web members can be rendered where they work in tension but not in compression because there's something about the situation that gives us confidence that we can handle those bays in that way. So some people would consider this a weak bay in that this, this diagonal member can't act in compression. Some bays have so little force in them we may choose to deal with the shear force in some other way. So for example, here we have a long pedestrian bridge across a road that's occurring at an airport, and this is a common technique. So this bridge is supported by a truss, which is basically in this glass wall. And you'll notice that some of the diagonals have been left out near the center of the truss. The, uh, the diagonal uh, forces are fairly small and if we have a deep enough beam on the top and the bottom and sturdy enough verticals and we moment connect these verticals to the horizontals at top and bottom then this portion becomes a Virendeel truss or a rigid frame truss and then we only put the diagonals in where the shear forces become quite large, which is near the end of the truss. And again, uh, one has to orchestrate all this well, and if you want to leave out a bunch of these diagonals, you need to make sure that this portion of your truss is a good, sturdy, rigid frame. Here's an example of an even more exotic structure. Um, this structure is cantilevering out from the core of the larger building. And this is a one story deep cantilevering truss, which they've chosen to run the diagonals in this direction, which is fine. They've had to make those pretty fat because they're working in compression. Uh, we have another one story deep truss on the other side that cantilevers out. So the last support is basically at the, at the point of this wall and this entire structure is cantilevering out that far. Now in this case they only went one floor deep and the reason is that this is a cantilever that's less than twice its depth so it has really deep proportions already. There was no need to go up and truss the next floor. And by the way, to keep this truss from pulling this portion of the building over, there are diagonals back deeper in the building that counteract these diagonals. You can't see those diagonals, but they are crucial to the performance of this structure. And for various architectural reasons, they did not want to have those diagonals deep in the building up above. So they did not triangulate this portion of the structure they only trust or diagonalize this portion, which as I said is plenty because this truss is, is less than uh, twice the depth. And typically we've said uh, cantilevered trusses can go up to lengths of eight to 12 times whatever the depth of the truss is. So this is a very sturdy, very stiff truss it supports this line of columns and the one on the other side supports that line of columns. And now we have this two story deep truss, simple span truss in this wall that spans from this support point to that support point. And notice what they've done. The usual thing is we'll put diagonals in the last two bays or, or so and leave the center bays untriangulated. But in the case of this structure, because they have such deep members here and here and up there, they had confidence that Virendeel or rigid frame action would allow them to span from there to there. So for whatever reasons, they decided rather than put a diagonal in this bay, they moved it over to this bay. 
There's no reason they can't do that. It's not the normal way that it would get done. But because these beams are so deep and these verticals are thick enough, the moment connections here and there and there and there and there and there allows this portion of the structure out here to be supported off of this portion through the action that's occurring, the moment frame action that's occurring in this bay. Um, and by the way, I apologize for this picture, but it was taken indoors from a photograph uh, that the contractor had available. Um, and, and it shows the bare truss. And by the time I got there, this was the state of the building. So I wanted you to be able to see what was happening in these portions that have been already covered. So here is that long facade that's being supported with a deep truss with a diagonal there, one there, one there, and one there. And this is a closer up view. This is the interior showing the diagonals on the top floor coming off of this support point here, that support point there. So this shows one of those diagonals welded into this column and you'll notice by the way cutting this diagonal on this very shallow angle gives a very long weld line here so the connection between this truss and that vertical is really a good connection. This shows one of the interior connections and again you'll notice the center line of this column and the center line of this beam and the center line of that member all intersect at a common working point which is about right there and that's a crucial uh, point to avoid uh, twisting or moment in the members framing into this point and I want you to notice full weld all the way around, full weld along that line, and full weld there. And this is one of the joints down at the bottom of that truss where the, the truss element is penetrating through the floor, the concrete floor. <coughs> or I should say uh, corrugated steel decking and concrete uh, in composite action. This is one of the splice joints that was made in the field. And this is a closer up view. Again, we've learned that this plate is to transfer the vertical or shear forces. This plate transfers the horizontal forces in the bottom flange. There's a similar plate up above that transfers the horizontal forces from this top flange to that top flange, this plate and that plate above give restore the moment capacity of this member. And remember that that needs to be done because that member is not just a truss element acting in tension or compression. It is also a bending member because this truss is a combination of, a full, of triangulated bays and moment framed bays and the moment capacity of these horizontal members is a crucial part of making those moment frame bays do the job they need to do. So this portion is cantilevering out of the building. We have simple span supporting all of this and then we're going to view underneath all of this and the crucial thing is to notice that this outer element here are those truss pieces diagonal truss pieces coming through this is one of those splice joints the key thing to notice is these beams are spanning from there out to be supported off the bottom of this truss um, these beams could not possibly cantilever out that far and there are no columns or compressive elements occurring there. So the support of this entire edge is due to the truss up above. 
Again, this is the overall view of that structure. Here are some of the interior compression members. Notice, by the way, that this is a wide flange beam. These welded, thick welded plates are coming off the vertical. Um, again, the center line of this member, the center line of that vertical, and the center line of the deep beam up above all are, are at a common working point. Um, in the case of this structure, this wide flange is connect, connected to this gusset plate with angles. So the angles are here are bolted uh, through the flange of the wide, wide flange element. And then the other side of this angle is then bolted to the gusset plate. And this is a closer up view of that. So these are flanges, one flange and then the other of that compressive wide flange section. And this shows you the bolts connecting it into the gusset plate and the bolts connecting this angle, this mediating angle, into the flange of the wide flange shape. So we have four of these angles that are doing this uh, connection process. Okay, this is a uh, structure which is actually featured in the book uh, relative to this sort of arch supporting the roof, but we're going to revisit it now in terms of trusses and and these are some images that don't occur in the book but you'll notice we have this atrium with a long narrow uh, glazed system the logical way to span it is to span it in the short direction across here and this has been done so you'll notice these four trusses that are planar trusses they're horizontal they're there to resist wind over pressure on the glass or wind suction on the glass. Those trusses would be very floppy and would tend to fall down if it wasn't for these vertical suspension elements. There are one, two, three, four of those. Two supporting the uh, inner uh, cord member and two of them supporting the outer cord member near the glass. And those suspension elements or suspenders are hung off of this um, rectangular cross-section truss up above. So there's a horizontal truss at the bottom, a horizontal truss at the top. So let's go get a closer view of that. We have this horizontal truss, which helps resist wind, but also helps stabilize this whole assembly. Then we have another horizontal truss at the top. And then we have a vertical truss in this face and then in the interior face. So this tubular truss, and we'll talk more about this when we talk about mutually bracing or self-bracing trusses, this uh, rectangular cross-section tubular truss is very strong for resisting gravity and very strong for resisting the horizontal forces of wind. And these vertical uh, trusses uh, help support the cables, which subsequently support the horizontal trusses below, which are what are backing up the glass against wind pressure. So this is a view looking down on those trusses. You'll notice these members are rendered as rods, um, and, and they're positioned to primarily wind, resist wind pressure against this wall. So they'd be acting in tension. But under wind suction, they are also going to go into compression. And it may not look like it, but uh, because they're fairly short, uh, these rods are actually adequate, even working in compression, to resist the wind suction that's tending to suck this wall out. Uh, one might argue that this is not the greatest geometry to pick, given that these diagonal elements have to work in both tension and compression. Their intention under the major force of wind pressure on this face, they're in compression under the somewhat lesser force of wind suction uh, tending to pull the glass outward. This is a view up at the truss assembly up at the top where we have two vertical planar trusses and two horizontal planar trusses. <coughs> 
which are knit together to produce this tubular truss, which again is able to handle the vertical gravity forces and the horizontal wind forces. Now, we, we've talked about this particular geometry here as a common one for steel, where the vertical members are primarily working in compression, at least under gravity forces. These elements are in compression, these are in tension, we've rendered those as fatter. Now, if the structure gets very large, we might want to provide more support under this top cord. For example, this top cord will be in bending under whatever decking exists on the top of it, but it's also in compression, so it's vulnerable to buckling. So it would be nice if we came and supported it more frequently. And this particular method of subdivision is one that can be used. This is a tension member. That's a compression strut. This tension member works in conjunction with this portion of this diagonal. So we have a sling right here that supports this compression strut. So this is kind of a, um, a little variation on the theme here. And by the way, you might wonder why I'm even doing this because if this is the true size of a person, I should have redrawn this without this person or made this person much smaller because you would never go to this much detail for a span of this short distance. I mean, this would be more than enough elaboration on this truss, and this level of detail wouldn't be necessary. But if you're doing a sports stadium where this is 400 feet or 600 feet, then this uh, additional level of detail and articulation becomes really beneficial in terms of making the structure more efficient. That ends our video on square and rectangular bay trusses with parallel cord truss geometry.